much for joining the talk today. My name is Paul Brebner. I'm the technology evangelist at InstaCluster. I'm based in Canberra in Australia. Uh, this talk is called Building and Scaling Robust Zero Code Internet of Things Streaming Data Pipelines with Open Source Technologies. Uh, we're going to be looking at Apache Kafka, Kafka Connect, Camel Kafka Connectors, Elasticsearch Kibana, Prometheus Grafana, PostgreSQL, and Apache SuperSearch. So that's quite a variety of technologies. Basically, what I spend most of my time doing is learning new open source technologies, um, coming up with realistic, interesting demonstration applications, getting it to work, and then writing blogs, and occasionally giving talks. So thanks very much um, for the invite for this track. Um, I actually talked in the IoT track in Germany a couple of years ago. Um, so I think that's the second ApacheCon track that I've talked, and I've also talked in quite a few other tracks because a lot of our technology is uh, sort of horizontal. They're cross-cutting across a lot of different um, sort of silos, which this one is as well. Uh, so the InstaCluster managed platform, it's a complete ecosystem to support mission-critical open source big data applications. Uh, there's a lot of different use cases um, for storage, streaming, analysis, and searching. Um, we offer lots of different technology supports on multiple different cloud platforms and expert support and security and all the enterprise things that you actually need in a production environment. So this talk focuses in particular on IoT use cases uh, and that bunch of technologies I mentioned. We're going to be looking at two different options in the pipeline, Elasticsearch plus Kibana for option one and option two is PostgreSQL plus Apache SuperSet. And pipes. Here's a slightly puzzling pipe, which I first encountered in Berlin. Um, possibly it's for transporting beer, given that Germans love their beer, and there are, are actually uh, beer transportation pipelines, I believe, in Germany. Uh, pipes can be sort of boring as well, just long and straight, heading off into the distance. Other pipes can be a lot more fun, potentially dangerous. Uh, and pipes and integration in general um, can be quite complicated. This, for example, is um, part of a rocket system. So is building a robust, scalable, zero-code open source data pipeline a pipe dream? Well, let's find out. First, we'll have a look at the background story. Then we'll look at the two different options, uh, something about monitoring, and then some of the scalability results we actually got very recently, last week, in fact, and look at some of the conclusions comparing the two different options. Um, no smoking if you're in person. If you're at home, I guess you can do what you like. So what's the story? Um, well, last year, before ApacheCon last year, in fact, I watched the Kafka Summit um, and discovered that the CDC had built a Kafka COVID-19 pipeline in under 30 days, which I thought was pretty impressive. Um, some of our consultants also built an integration demo using public climate change data via REST connectors running on Docker, which um, I thought was cool as well. So I had an idea, which was to use streaming REST public data sources and deploy on the InstaCluster managed platform. So the problem was we needed some public streaming REST APIs with easy to use JSON data format, complete data, interesting domain, and not too political or apocalyptic. It sounded a bit impossible, but after some searching, I found an example. Uh, the USA National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, tidal data proved to be a really good um, example use case. Did you know that tides follow the lunar day? This is a little animation from their website. And it turns out that the whole lunar day thing isn't 24 hours. It's 24 hours and 50 minutes long. So that's something I didn't exactly know. I sort of knew that tides didn't exactly follow the 24-hour um, Earth day, though. So that was interesting. So the, the NOAA website has a lot of information. It's got some pretty cool maps, so you can actually see where all their sensors are. Um, you can have a look at particular locations and drill down and find out the name of the location. Um, a lot of the sort of the metadata around um, the data capture uh, picture as well, which is quite handy, I guess. Um, you can drill down and find what information is available from the sensors. And you can have a look at the API as well. So it's a pretty well documented API. Um, so that was my starting point. So I, I built a REST example, 
Um, so I can get some sample data back from that API and just test it out and see what, what the data looked like in reality. Um, so you have to specify the station ID, the data type and datum. I used water level, mean sea level in particular, and how much data you want. I just always wanted the latest data point and the format of the data, and I just always wanted JSON. So here's an example of the call and the resulting JSON, which has two parts, the metadata and the data um, elements. So let's start our pipeline using this REST API for the data sources. So what else do we need to build the pipeline? Well, the common technology we're going to use is Kafka Connect. Kafka Connect is a distributed solution to integrate Kafka with other heterogeneous data store sources and stores. Um, it has connectors, either source or sync flavors, which handle the details of particular integrations. And why are we using this? Well, it's zero code integration in theory. It provides a highly available framework and elastic scaling independent of the Kafka cluster itself. So let's start looking at option one. This was the variant where I wanted to look at Elasticsearch and Kibana. Uh, this was the one I originally did, in fact, um, for a sponsored talk at ApacheCon last year. It's evolved a lot since then. Um, Elasticsearch is a scalable um, technology for searching indexed documents. It has another uh, tool called Kibana for visualization. And the version that we use in InstaCluster is Open Distro for Elasticsearch, which is the 100% Apache licensed version. So using our InstaCluster managed service and the console, which supports that, you can provision the Kafka and Kafka Connect clusters very easily. And you end up with Kafka and Kafka Connect clusters running. Um, so that's sort of our starting point for building the pipeline. So next we had to find a REST connector. Um, and for this particular case, we have to deploy it to an S3 bucket, which is the way for our managed service we get um, foreign connectors into our managed service and then tell the Kafka Connect cluster which bucket to look in and configure the connector and then run it. So there's a link there to our instructions on how to do the um, bring your own connector part of things. Here's an example of the REST source connector configuration, including things like the connector name, the class, the URL, and topic. So there's a lot of um, commonality in the connector configurations, depending on who wrote them and, and what it's designed to do. But there are quite significant differences as well, which can be a bit confusing sometimes. Uh, so this polls every 10 minutes. It writes the result to a Kafka topic. I picked five sensors more or less at random to use. So I've got five connector instances running in total. So now we've got the title data coming into the tides topic. What next? Uh, so to pursue the option one path, we have provision an elastic search and Kibana cluster. And I've done that again through our managed um, service through the console. There's a lot of options there. Um, and finally, we have to configure the default uh, Elasticsearch sync connector to send data to Elasticsearch. Now we actually have one by default, so I didn't need to um, mess around with the S3 bucket uh, part of the story there. Um, here's the example configuration. You've got to specify again things like the sync connector name, the class, the index, and the topic. Um, in Elasticsearch, the index is created with the default mappings if it doesn't already exist, which, which is what I started with. So great, it's all working well, sort of. So the tide data arrives in the tides index, which is what we wanted. Um, the NOAA data is JSON and Elasticsearch is JSON native. So that's all good. But in the default index mappings, everything is unfortunately just a string by default. So to graph um, something as a time series by name, you actually need a custom mapping. So here's an example of a custom, custom mapping. T is a date, V is a double, and name is a keyword. So they're the, um, the changes I made to the default types. Uh, and unfortunately, re-indexing. Every time you change an Elasticsearch index mapping, you have to delete the index and index all the data again. But where does the data come from? Well, there's two options. Using a Kafka sync connector, the data is already in the Kafka topic, so you can just replay it. Or you can use the Elasticsearch re-index operation. So the hard part is over now. 
you can start the Kibana with a single click in our managed console. And this is the Kibana homepage. So in order to visualize um, some of the title data, these are the steps that you have to follow. You have to um, create an index pattern. You have to create the visualization. And then you have to configure the graph settings for that, that particular visual, visualization type. And there's all the, the details of how I did that. And if you're lucky, you will end up with a graph that looks sort of like this for our example data. Um, this shows time on the x-axis versus the average uh, tide level relative um, to the average level in meters for the five sample stations that I was collecting data from. So that's working quite well. What else can we see? Well, we can see the lunar day, which we saw before. This is the 24-hour, 50-minute uh, period um, that the tides follow. So that's pretty cool. You can also see something else that perhaps I wasn't expecting, that some locations have quite big ranges. For example, this one here uh, shows a tidal variation of around three meters at near bay. So tide range varies depending on a whole bunch of things, uh, moon, sun, local geography, and even the weather. So this map actually shows you around the world where the, the more extreme tidal um, ranges occur. And Nia Bay is actually at that location there in the US. Um, and what I hadn't realized was Australia actually has some of the biggest tidal ranges as well. So this is our big one. It's um, called the Horizontal Waterfalls. It's an 11 meter tide range um, where water basically is forced between two passages and flows horizontally. It's pretty cool. I haven't been there, but one day when hopefully all this pandemic's over, it'll be on my list of things to do. Um, so next, we wanted to see if we could come up with a map to show the sensor locations to sort of understand where these big tidal ranges were happening, perhaps. Um, so just creating a default um, map in Kibana is not very interesting, is it? There's no geo points in the data, so there's no um, geospatial data being displayed, unfortunately. So there's a couple of more mapping steps required to fix this. Elasticsearch doesn't recognize the separate lap long fields as geo points. You have to add an Elasticsearch ingest pipeline to pre-process documents before they are indexed. And then, of course, you have to re-index again, unfortunately, because you've changed the index. So the three steps are add geo point field to the index mapping, create Elasticsearch ingest pipeline to construct a new field, add as the default ingest pipeline to index. And I've got some examples here of how, did, how I did it. Here's the first step. You add a new location field with the geo point data type to the mapping and the index. Second step, we create a new ingest pipeline to construct a new location geo point string from the existing lat long fields. And the third step is to add the location pipe as the default pipeline to the index. And if you've done all that correctly, it should all work. So now we have a pipeline transforming the raw data and adding the geopoint location data in Elasticsearch. Uh, now, to, to actually do the, the mapping, create the map visualization, you reuse an existing index pattern, you create the visualization, and then configure the graph settings to display the data correctly. And hopefully it'll give you a map a bit like this. So this, this map shows some of the sensor locations and a value that I selected, which was the minimum value over a period of a week. That's quite cool. And you can do quite powerful things. You can actually add your own custom web map service layer. Um, this one is a bit strange. It seems to have a bit of a gap between Alaska and the USA. I'm sure there's another country that's supposed to be there. So that's all great, but what can go wrong? Um, well, first of all, the REST call to the NOAA API can actually return JSON error messages, um, but it doesn't treat it as an error. So it's just sent to the tides topic and to the Elasticsearch index. So you just get a JSON um, string in the index, which says error, which isn't very useful to have. The second problem is, is perhaps a bit worse. The REST call can actually return an HTTP error message. But again, it doesn't treat it as an error. So it is sent to the TIDES topic. And what happens then? Now, the Elasticsearch 
sync connector tries to read the HTTP error message and fails to a fail state. Uh, and you can look at the exceptions in the Kafka Connect logs topic to find out what has gone wrong. So the Kafka Connect framework automatically restarts workers if they are killed, which I'd sort of, I knew that, and I was expecting it to automatically restart um, workers if they had failed, but evidently it doesn't. So it's a bit like playing whack-a-mole, unfortunately. Uh, one solution is if connectors support KIP 298, called error handling in connect, not surprisingly, then you can configure it to ignore input errors and errors are sent to a dead letter topic. Uh, where can we find connectors with more robust error handling? So in the Australian outback, you often see signs like this one, sort of warning you of um, hopping animals, things that look like guinea pigs, but which are a lot bigger called wombats and funny looking horse things. So in fact, Apache Camel is one potential solution. Um, in Australia, there are a lot of wild camels. They actually have the most, and Apache Camel actually has 346 Kafka connectors, which is a lot of connectors in one place as well. Apache Camel is quite a mature technology. Um, it was designed for integration. There are lots of components uh, to integrate everything with everything. But where did so many Kafka connectors come from? Where, how did Camel meet Kafka? Uh, Camel Kafka Connector is a new sub-project that enables Camel components to be used as Kafka Connect connectors. How does it do this? Uh, well, the magic really is automatic generation of connectors from the Camel components. Uh, source and or sync connectors are available depending on which Camel components are actually there. Uh, the Kafka connector configuration contains a mixture of Kafka Connect and Camel configuration. So you need to read the documentation for both the Camel component and also the Camel Kafka connector. And there's a fair bit of trial and error, to be honest, to find all the required fields and debug, debug them and get it to work. So let's take it for a test ride. Uh, here's an example, Camel Kafka Elasticsearch sync connector. Uh, configured um, to provide error tolerance. Uh, so the highlighted um, lines there are the, the main ones that I had to add, which are the important bits. Uh, so now we have robust handling of HTTP errors and the connector keeps running. So we've solved one of the problems, which is that if you don't get JSON coming in um, from the source connector, it actually uh, rejects that and keeps on running. I tried to handle the JSON error messages as well on the Elasticsearch side using um, a, a, a sort of a type of schema validation where you set dynamic to strict. Um, that works on the Elasticsearch side, but unfortunately I couldn't configure the connector to keep on running and it goes into the fail state again. So that's sort of the end of the, the first experiment, which was option one. Option two um, involves PostgreSQL on the sync side and Apache Superset, which I thought might be of some interest to the Apache community, given that Superset has recently become a sort of high level Apache project. So why was I interested in this combination? Well, two things, curiosity and opportunity. Um, Apache Superset looked like an interesting alternative to Kibana, but only works with SQL databases. Uh, PostgreSQL is an open source SQL database and it was on our managed services roadmap and available initially to me as an internal preview. It's actually available now externally as well. Um, and PostgreSQL has excellent JSON support as well. Uh, there's a JSON B column type, which is an indexed JSON binary format for complex and fast JSON query. So it sounds like um, that combination of technologies could be an equivalent um, to the first option we looked at. Um, so the first problem is finding open source Kafka Connect PostgreSQL sync connectors. W was there a lot of choice? No, in fact, I could only find one that was explicitly for PostgreSQL. Um, but then I thought, well, how about JDBC sync connectors? Because PostgreSQL supports JDBC, and it turns out there's a lot of um, potential JDBC connectors available. Um, so I had to do an evaluation of some of the options available. 
Uh, unfortunately, most of them assume that you have an explicit schema as part of the payload, which I don't for my example. They also assume you have a simple flat JSON data object. I don't, mine is structured. And they also assume that you want to insert the elements into multiple columns in PostgreSQL, which I didn't want to do either. So uh, what was the solution? Schemaless uh, JSON to JSON B. I hacked an IBM open source JDBC sync connector to read a JSON Kafka record value, create a PostgreSQL um, table with two columns, an auto-incrementing ID and a single JSON B column with something called a JIN index, which indexes the entire JSON uh, binary object, and then insert the JSON object into that column. Um, so that worked pretty well. Uh, it's pretty robust. PostgreSQL itself rejects invalid JSON, including the HTTP errors uh, that I was getting. And you can also configure it with constraints, for example, to check if JSON has a data and metadata fields, which also rejects the JSON error messages. So that worked pretty well. Um, next, I had some questions about whether Apache Superset was going to work, including how, how to deploy it. The answer was, after a few false starts, running it in Docker on my laptop. Will it connect to PostgreSQL easily? Yes, it was easy. And it turns out PostgreSQL is the default metadata store for Superset anyway. And then probably the, the trickiest question I had in mind was, can it access and chart JSON B PostgreSQL data types? Um, the answer is yes, by using virtual data sets. You have to use PostgreSQL JSON B operators, casts, and functions to create a virtual data set with separate columns, which you can then chart as if it was a normal table in PostgreSQL. So here's the example of the virtual data set for the NOAA data. Um, there's a lot of um, PostgreSQL specific um, JSON um, operators and functions and the cast and lots of things there, but it does actually work. But you have to um, write that by hand, unfortunately. Uh, then you pick a visualization type. Here's an example of the map, map, map box visualization, um, which essentially clusters all the locations, which is very similar, in fact, to one of the, the, um, the displays we saw from the NOAA website itself. Um, so the main, one of the main features of Superset is that it's got a, a sort of a code-free, SQL-free chart builder. So normally you don't have to write the SQL yourself, but because we were using the JSONB data type, we did have to do that step. But once you've got that and the virtual data set, the SQL-free chart builder actually does work really well with it. Um, and you can play around with lots of different chart types as well. Uh, the only um, thing I did note that is that you have to get and configure a map box token for the geospatial visualizations to work. Uh, there are lots of visualization types in Superset, at least 50 and more. And many um, are, of them are the deck.gl geospatial charts for quite detailed geospatial scenarios. Um, here's an example of perhaps a slightly more interesting one. It's deck.gl scatterplot. Um, and the size and color of the dots, uh, sea level trends in millimeters a year, uh, which basically tells you that some locations will flood earlier than others in the coming century. Uh, this used a different data set to the, the real time data, which we've seen up till now. It was actually the, the, the set of sea level trend data. All right, the next part of the talk is really about scalability. So we, we've looked at the functional aspects of the two options. Now we're going to see how we can scale the pipelines up and actually start getting some, getting more data moving through them and into the visualization tools. Um, in order to know how well each pipeline is scaling, you need to be able to take some measurements. And there's a lot of things to measure. And cut a long story short, um, I collected the, the measurements shown in uh, green here from different systems using Prometheus from the InstaCluster Monitoring API and displayed them on a Grafana dashboard. So the goal basically then is to increase the tasks and throughputs while keeping the lag down. And these were the graphs that I, um, I decided on that, that would enable the, uh, the scaling process to proceed sensibly, hopefully. 
So scalability, let's race Elasticsearch and PostgreSQL and see which one comes out fastest. Here are the, um, the resources I used in each of those technology stacks. So we're comparing Postgres on the left with Elasticsearch on the right. Um, there's basically three different cluster types involved in each pipeline. Um, Kafka and Kafka Connect in blue and orange are common. And then the difference is whether there's PostgreSQL or Elasticsearch on the sync side. Um, PostgreSQL has basically two relatively large instances. One is set up as the master and one is set up as the replica. On Elasticsearch, there's three data nodes and three dedicated um, master nodes, which are slightly smaller instances. Um, the total number of cores is, is pretty much the same across those two pipelines. And it basically comes out to the same amount of money as well per month um, on AWS to, to pay for those instances. Um, so in terms of scalability, I'm only focusing on inserts at the moment. I'll probably do some more experiments eventually. Um, so check out the blogs maybe in a few months to see whether I've done the read experiments. But in terms of inserts, a second, uh, here is my first attempt, um, both using the Kafka sync connectors into the two different technologies. Uh, on the left, there's a whole bunch of um, settings there, which um, I sort of ended up with as a result of optimizing things on the configuration side. Um, so this is sort of an apples to apples comparison. It's the same technology throughout, except for the PostgreSQL and Elasticsearch um, sync sides of the pipeline. Um, PostgreSQL gives about 42,000 inserts a second. Uh, unfortunately, Elasticsearch was only giving about 1,800 inserts a second, which um, is a very small apple by comparison to PostgreSQL apple. Um, I knew something wasn't really working as expected here. We've got internal benchmarking that shows that that type of cluster should uh, handle a lot more writes than that and also other external benchmarks. So I had another go. So as in traditional Mythbusters style, for my second attempt, I would basically make everything work um, as I wanted um, and get them as close as I could to 40,000 inserts a second, which is quite a, quite a big number, actually, in terms of inserts a day. It's 3.4 billion inserts a day. Um, and how did I do it? Well, for Elasticsearch, I actually threw out the Kafka Connect um, option and used an Elasticsearch Python client set up as a load generator, uh, running it about with 50 threads. And the most important change that I discovered was that you really have to use something called the bulk API. And there were at least 20 um, documents being sent to Elasticsearch per call. The real problem, I think, is that the HTTP protocol for Elasticsearch is just too slow and has too much overhead. Um, so that enabled me to get to a pretty close result to Postgres. Um, so there are a few caveats around that result. Um, so it turned out the replication in Postgres was asynchronous accidentally. I had expected it to be synchronous, whereas the replication in Elasticsearch is synchronous and was. Um, turning on synchronous replication in Postgres will reduce the throughput in theory. Um, the Postgres uh, master server CPU plateaued for some reason at 50%. So I was only using half of the cores. So that's a bit of a question mark over that. Whereas compared to Elasticsearch, it was at about 80%. Um, Elasticsearch does scale horizontally with more nodes and shards. So basically doubling the number of data nodes in Elasticsearch should double that, um, that number as well. So it's, it's a bit hard to make any um, definitive comparisons at this point in time. Um, on the other hand, though, the data was identical. It was identical JSON, JSON data being sent to both systems uh, with very similar size and cost clusters. Um, so some conclusions. First of all, looking at the common technology Kafka Connect. Um, Kafka Connect enabled heterogeneous source sync, zero code integration with streaming JSON data. Uh, but some custom mappings and or SQL was required for the sync systems to get it to work. Uh, it had good scalability and throughput. 
Um, this was aided by custom monitoring. For scale, you have to increase the connected tasks, the Kafka partitions, and the sync systems resources as well. And Kafka Connect did turn out to be one of the more resource intensive parts of the system. Um, two useful Kafka superpowers were the ability to uh, buffer spiky loads and the ability to replay data. Um, that's quite handy in a lot of cases, particularly around testing and when you're connecting up more sync systems to the system already there. Um, open source Kafka connectors are of varying quality, functionality, robustness, and performance. You really need to evaluate and test with both valid and invalid data. Um, robustness is a function of the connectors and the sync systems in some cases. Um, I had to hack some of the code to work correctly um, to get my complex schemaless JSON data to work. Um, and you really need to test the performance and scalability out before um, going into a production environment. In terms of Elasticsearch versus PostgreSQL, um, there's a whole bunch of points that it could be compared on. Um, on the Elasticsearch side, the sync connectors work, but you did need the bulk API, which is possible in theory. Um, on the PostgreSQL side, I had to hack one of the connectors to work correctly. Uh, Elasticsearch handled one error type, PostgreSQL handled both error types. Um, on the, the Elasticsearch side, um, all the mappings are done on the ingest side. On PostgreSQL, um, they are not done on the ingest side. Uh, resources and cost were comparable. Um, right throughput, comparable, taking into account all the caveats that I mentioned before. Horizontal scalability, Elasticsearch um, from past experience is excellent, and PostgreSQL so far, I haven't tested that out at all. Uh, Kibana versus Apache Superset for the um, visualization. Um, in some ways, um, the, the main difference is really how many charts are available. Um, and the amount of customization, I guess, and, and also the database support. So initially, I assumed that Superset would only work on SQL databases, but I believe it now works on Elasticsearch as well. So it could, in theory, work for both options. Um, yeah, the customization, I guess, on Superset was a bit more extensive because of the JSONB SQL qu uh, query requirement. Um, so that's it for, for this talk. Hopefully. You've learned something about making open source pipelines with all these technologies. If you want to try it out, um, it's possible to do a two week free trial of all these technologies. Just go to our website and check it out. All the um, all of the blogs and and configuration examples, et cetera, are also available. If you go to instacluster.com slash Paul Brebner, um, look for the pipeline blog series and the the associated github and you can replicate all of this yourself or um, whatever comes to mind you can um, are only limited really by your imagination as far as these technologies go so thanks very much um, if there's any questions i will be able to look at the chat i hope after the talk at some point um, so goodbye from me